nothing appropriate about a woman, an adult woman with an underage teenage boy or a, a child, like younger than that. that so, again, it's really important that um, through this process we have some sort of education campaign because it's really that. Once you know, you know it's it's not good. And unfortunately, there are some people who don't have access to um, other materials and, and resources and and research from medical institutes to to tell them okay this is wrong there are actually some people who don't get why this is wrong I mean I think we're all born with an internal moral compass that helps us gauge this isn't a good situation or this this is a bad situation you know we kind of get that gut feeling but there are complete families and societies going around thinking this is normal for whatever reason and that's insane because the scars that type of thinking and that type of abuse leaves on children, you know, it's, it's irreparable. And yes, I, I think um, if we, we can, to Lucia, we were talking a lot about the sex offender registry and um, her point of view, and we still live in a society here in St. Lucia, I feel that um, where the topic of sex or the topic of sexuality or coming of age in your sexuality taboo and we don't quite know how to approach it let alone when it's to do with inappropriate sexual activity so we know that it's wrong with it but how to approach it how to say it and then there's the the also i mean there's the problem of poverty in our nation so there's a woman with four or five children you know one of them uh maybe seven eight years old and then there's the who's helping her take care of the children because she can't do anything by herself and she feels that there's, there's nothing that she can do. She has to let it happen. No, that is totally wrong and something is wrong with our society where this woman can't say, stop hurting my child, get out, and, and feel like, okay, her resources will be taken from her. I mean, what do we have in place in St. Lucia that... And that's another issue. That's not what this campaign is about. But, you know, we we need to do more, I think, for for our our people. Um, and maybe, and I, I totally don't want to go this direction because this is um, not a political issue. And But there has to be some kind of um, system in place where, you know, nobody feels scared about this and that that happens not just in St. Lucia the feeling of you know being dependent on somebody who's victimizing you it's um it's something that happens all over the world and there are support groups and uh even shelters in in some places in the region um in St. Lucia, of course, there are plenty of, there are a good number of support groups of awesome organizations that have championed this cause prior to Zandoli picking up. So we have a lot of respect for those organizations and we invite those organizations to stand with us um, because this isn't something we can do by ourselves. Absolutely not, never. I mean, we can never tackle this on our own. So we would like to you know, work with those other organizations and support groups who are already established in St. Lucia to see what we can contribute to what they've already been doing. Because there should be some sort of support groups in place. And, and I know that there are a few, um, but maybe a, a more publicized campaign that, you know, you can speak out. And I don't know what these support groups offer, but Generally, you know, support groups for women and children or domestic violence support groups. I know those offer a lot more resources than, you know, saying I'm speaking out against my provider who's molesting my children. I need your help. And this is how it's going to mess my life up. Can you help me make this? Can you help me make this happen and, and still, you know, not ruin my life, not be kicked out of my home? So... Um, 
that's, you know, again, it's not a, something we can do on our own. We're going to need the help of those other groups um, that have maybe established resources or we can put a system in place where, you know, if you have to speak out that with something like that and you're going to lose out on your your provisions for the month or whatever period of time that, you know, there's a support group that makes sure you don't get kicked out of your home or that you can work your way to independence um, and not have to deal with this because that's horrible. There, there are no words for um, the level of evil like that represents. And, you know, so many people. Right now, somewhere in St. Lucia, you know, some some child is being, um, some child is being lured away from school, or, you know, some child didn't go to school today because of something that happened to them last night with somebody they trusted. There, are, this is not something that we're making up. This is a real issue, and it happens every day to one of us. And. <laughs> Independent and and you know I think sometimes we can't use the word independent with arrogant or 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 feeling like you're better than. But independence is and and having a healthy self esteem, a healthy ego, um, shows you like you said to listen to that voice in the side that tells you something is not quite right here. Absolutely, and broken people who are used to being violated don't have healthy self-esteem and they don't feel confident saying this is happening to me. Some don't even feel that it's that bad what's happening to them. I spoke with um, someone very re recently and, and the person said to me they didn't even know they'd been molested until, you know, they were an adult and they had to come to terms with, they, they saw some major event happened, they encountered the person that did this to them, and they mentioned it to them, like, hey, remember you used to do this to me? And this person totally, like, shell-shocked, was just coming to the terms that, with the fact that, you know, he had been molested. So, <sighs> Broken people do not have a healthy sense of uh, healthy self-esteem and they cannot, there's the sense of independence that you need to help you function or the sense of self-worth and self-appreciation that you need to help you function as a an individual citizen, an independent citizen. It's impossible to expect that. Um, from somebody who's been violated. And if we're having people like adults who've been violated and these are broken adults and their issues haven't been dealt with, you know, you're going to see broken children. Whether their children are abused or not, um, that it, it's still going to affect how they raise their children and what they have them around. Some people, it's to the point where it happened to them so much that it's so normal. So if it happens to their child, they're just like, uh, oh, that's not a big deal. That's, that's nothing. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Don't tell nobody. Don't tell nobody. And that's not okay. It traumatized you. But to the point where this person hasn't even come to grips with the fact that it hurt them and it was wrong and it should never happen again. Like, it's just, it becomes something that, you know, we we have an attitude about, don't worry, don't talk about it, it's okay. Um, and then it that doesn't make it go away. That doesn't make it stop. And that doesn't take away from the pain and it doesn't deal with the, the scars that are left behind. And these are more generations coming forward over a period of time and you know I'm really confident with um all that we've been able to do since the petition launched um we've actually partnered with a series of organi organizations here in St. Lucia and throughout the OECS so it's really promising um even at the UN level we've been able to really make some awesome connections and have some 
great organizations on board to support this worthy cause. We will be speaking more on exactly what that means for this petition and maybe our region um, at another date. But more people are supporting this than there are against it, and we're so grateful for the St. Lucian people um, and the people in the region that just feel like this is the right thing to do. You know, Camille, I, I, I love that you mentioned that there are more people who are in support of it than are against it because um, quite by accident, we I had a conversation with one of our local establishments geared towards creating harmony with the youth and progress for the nation in general. And uh, I'd mentioned to him about the registry just to find out what he and the organization might do if it ever came again. And he said that he was personally in agreement with the registry, felt that it was important to look at all sides because some, something that is meant for good can actually cause more chaos. And so when I asked him to elaborate, he said, well, you know, you have a sex offender Maybe he's trying to get his life back on track or her life back on track. And now you put his or her name in a registry for everyone to peruse, take a look at. Perhaps that might put that sex offender over the edge and make them spend even more. What do you think about that? I think no, because the data and the evidence shows that when you are held in the sunshine, when you are held accountable for your actions and people are looking at you, you're more likely to straighten up than you are to mess up again. And that is just the empirical evidence from different, uh, the child, um, child molestation research and prevention institute and that's one of them and dozens of other sexual abuse organizations this is why these systems are in place other in in other countries um in you know even in the region there may not be like legal standardized uh situations in place like this but you know we all internally and as a community have ways of dealing with these things you know you know that this person is a sex offender a child sex offender every little girl in the community would know that and that's just how we function as people we protect our children now we will not go to the public and say hey, this person did this. But you know in your neighborhood. I mean, people will talk. That's just how we, we function. And when you know, you're going to tell your girlfriend or your neighbor next door with kids or the single dad who has to go to work, um, you know, night shift and, and leaves his little, you know, his 12 and 13-year-old kids home alone because that's all he can do. So we we do talk as a society, but we talk in hushed tones, and it's to never leave the the secrecy and the privacy of um, those communications. So, again, I will say no that it for something that particular question. I, no, it, it won't make somebody go over the edge. And if it does, then there are other psychological issues that are, are not related to this. Again, I'm not a doctor. I'm just um, speaking based on the research I've gathered from third-party organizations. I'm not a sex abuse therapist, so this is just from my research. What most people don't understand is that we aren't just looking at a sex offender registry as a singular um, singular force or something as one thing to be implemented and just we leave the society to fall to pieces on its own because that's nonsensical and that would never work. We actually have a five-point um, process by which we expect to make this happen and, and have it work function work in work fluidly with um you know our social structure and our cultural structures in in our societies not just in St. Lucia but in the Eastern Caribbean region and that's really important as well Camille because you see in St. Lucia uh, St. Lucia is so small that something like this impacts us differently than it would 
in one of the larger countries, you know, you, you know is a sex offender and a registered sex offender, it would be more difficult to keep away from him or her, might somebody who can move to a different state or something like that. So I wondered, um, with the five-point plan that you mentioned, is um, the rehabilitation of the sex offender on that list at all. Absolutely, that's step four. So I'll just go through it quickly for you. And and in a few weeks, we would like to <clears throat> actually start publish publicizing, um, publishing and publicizing our um, five-point process. We're just allowing um, other organizations to look it over, add to it. And this by no means is like the final cut um, version. This is just a suggestion. <clears throat> so step one, it's our petition. We submit our petition. Step two, a third party organization, an NGO, submits a request to the government. Step three, um, step three is education. So a nationwide education campaign on child sexual abuse and what a pedophile is, what um, a child molester is, because they're different. And, you know, the difference between people who molest children just because they have an opportunity, like, you know, you're left alone with a child and you just take advantage of a child, compared to people who compulsively are obsessed with a sexual um interaction with l underage children. There's a total difference. Some people cannot help those thoughts. Does not make it okay. That means they need treatment and they need treatment now. <clears throat> Step four is treatment and assessing the treatment we have now for uh, sex abuse victims and pedophiles and um, child sex offenders <clears throat> and seeing what third party research institutions, um, doctors, like PhD sex, sex offender therapists, college and, colleges and universities that specialize in this type of research, you know, what recommendations are they willing to make based on, you know, their sex offender treatment methods um, and child sex abuse victim methods as well? <clears throat> and seeing, you know, if... The people of St. Lucia are receptive to that. If our Ministry of Health is receptive to maybe putting aside six months to train child sex offender therapists. Because you can't be a therapist for generalized issues and address this issue. It, it's something very tender and you need special licensing to, to combat this. So, see, you know, just hoping that, that our... Um, officials support what we're doing so that's step four and step five we like to call it consistency and again we are by no means saying this these are the laws you should put in place these are third party rec these are recommendations by third party organizations made to us that we are making to other third party organizations in St. Lucia and also the region so Consistency, meaning there should be a structure of laws in place that supports this whole process to harmonize it in a holistic way. And Camille, do you plan to have things and sit down with officials of the government to explain these uh, five points and uh, how how much um, labor is behind Zandoli to help bring about those kinds of changes? You know, Zandoli is only step one. We're just submitting the petition. That is all Zandoli is actually uh, doing in this case. Step two to four, those are third-party organizations that are coming on board with We Want to Know, with the, you know, the petition, and it's dubbed We Want to Know again. So, other organizations that come on board will do step two through five. So step two, you know, that's actually submitting a request to the government. Which organizations do we know that have submitted requests to the government in an official capacity? Which organizations have the standing to be able to do something like that? Step three, the education. You know, do like the Ministry of Education and um, 
other institutions that have done a really good job with uh, passing out information or pamphlets or doing nationwide workshops based on this. But I think a lot of it's been done from the victim standpoint. I don't know that much has been done in terms of nationwide education and workshops on pedophilia and child molestation and, and what that means and the differences. Um, there was actually a man that spoke out since we started this and he's like, help me. I need help. I don't want to be like this. This is a St. Lucia man in St. Lucia who, you know, is saying to us, this is who I am. We need help. Keep doing what you're doing. So these type of things, it's really encouraging to us that, you know, we're on the right track. Keep going because more often than not, people who are compulsive pedophiles or child sex offenders they don't want to be that way so you're saying just to recap you're saying that you heard from a saint lucian man who reached out to zandori saying please help me and keep doing what you're doing because i have these compulsions and i can't help it and i need help yes absolutely and you know we're not gonna uh disclose his name but i thought it was very brave of him to say I don't want to be like this, but these thoughts are in my mind. There should be somebody that this man can talk to, and not just talk to, because talk therapy does not work for compulsive disorders. Um, it might work for some other compulsive disorders, but not sex sexual deviations such as... Um, you know, child molestation and attraction to underage children. That is something that it almost becomes, um, it borders with hormonal and, and other things. So not because it's something they can't stop doesn't mean it's okay. And it's not to confuse it with sexual orientation either to say that, oh, you know, I, there was an instance once where, um, an individual sent someone in St. Lucia, a young lady, a a phone. And he had, he had this phone for about three weeks before he sent it to her. And when she opened it up, she said she went online. And what came up in the history was um, searches for child sex and child pornography and and under, like, discussing things. She was so repulsed, she sent it to me immediately. Like, she took a screenshot and she sent it to me. So I approached the individual and I, I asked, what is, what is this about? And, you know, he, he gave some excuse as to what it was. So I approached this person's brother because he's always around this, the brother's child who's, you know, underage child. So I said, you know, this happened and it looks like your brother's been watching child pornography. Um, I'm just letting you know, cause you're out of the country and he's always, he's with your, your daughter at times. So the brother's response to me was, Natalie, you're not going to believe it. The brother's response to me, and this is a St. A Saint Lucian guy living in St. Lucia. His response was like, so what? It's normal. Um, it's not that big of a deal. And what about the gay people? Wait, hold on, hold on one second, one second. You approached this individual's brother with the information that you got off of his phone. Yes. Which showcased the history, uh, online search of child pornography, yes. child, um, and the age children. Mm -hmm. um, when you spoke to this man whose brother... The owner of the bank is with the brother's underage daughter. He said, what's the big deal? Yes, he said it's normal. And, you know, and his argument was, what about gay people? And I couldn't believe this was an adult. He's over 30 years old. Comparing adult consensual sexual activity to violation of underage children and some people seem to think that sex like sexual perversions towards children it's normal and it's a sexual orientation it is not homosexuality that is a sexual orientation heterosexuality 
being a straight person, that is a sexual orientation. That is your sexual preference. This is who you were sexually attracted to. Being sexually attracted to underage children, that is not a sexual orientation. That is a dysfunction and there is treatment for it. You don't have to suffer alone. So I, I, you know, this is news to me, Camille, because I have never before heard or even suspected that any adult, whether it's in St. Lucia or anywhere else, would ever confuse sexual orientation, which, like you said, is your own sexual preference, and we can have an unending debate about that. Mm-hmm. But it's two adult con- adults consenting, consent, consenting to sex based on their feelings at a certain time with a, an adult person approaching in a sexual manner a child who does not have the wherewithal or the information or the instinct yet to know right from wrong or whether this is good or bad or if they even want to do it because the child is not electing to have sexual relations with anybody at that time. Who is confusing that with the other thing? Who are these people? You know, and I'm not going to put his name out there because that would just, yes, that would make his life uncomfortable. Um, but the, it's that kind of attitude and the it's just a lot. And I don't want to beat down on people and say, oh, my God, you're so ignorant. How could you say this? I believe, It's just a lack of education. Whether you like homosexuality or not, whatever your religious be- beliefs are, whatever faith you may um, have an inclination to, you cannot compare what two adults do together, whether you like it or not. Because some people will, you know, kill people, they'll smoke uh, crack, they'll do drugs. Those things are illegal, but they're adults and they make those decisions on their own. Um, I, for one, just can't understand how people can can confuse the two. But it, it, again, it's education. It's not okay. It's not the same thing. Being attracted to underage children, it is not a sexual orientation. And I cannot stress that enough. It, it's not something you choose. Um, I agree with you. It's not a sexual orientation. I am baffled by what you just said to me. I, I've never heard. You know, Natalie, I just, as I'm speaking to you, I just got a um, screenshot of some things that are being said about um, our organization. And huh, I really didn't want to have to go there. But it looks like a Sandal International Foundation is being... Um, attacked by whatever reasons and I just want to say to the public you know you can google us you can pull us up in the um you could just google us do a google search sandal international foundation new jersey nonprofit. you will pull us up in the new jersey business um listings and you know we're working hard to establish connections with reputable organizations that have come before us to do this so I'm not going to tolerate anybody coming in the way of what we're talking about and the most important thing at this time is child molestation prevention and that is our only concern that is our singular focus at this time we do have other things going on we have um been able to secure partnerships with some notable organizations in the past prior to this campaign, such as St. Joseph's Convent, um, the Basilica Cathedral, and, you know, that that's the whole Catholic Church in, the, in St. Lucia. Um, the Red Cross of St. Lucia, the St. Lucia House Foundation in New York, um, we're doing a, a lot of things and we're, we're continuing to, to partner with other organizations to increase our reach and expand our efforts. And I just want to tell anybody, if you have any questions about our ethics, what we do, how we function, please feel free. Visit our website. It's www.zandali.org. You're free to send an inquiry to the board and any one of the members or all of us will can look over your um, request or your concerns and we will speak to you directly we are as transparent as we can possibly be without violating the privacy of our board 
And you know, Camille, I wanted to ask you something as it comes to the rewritten article about uh, Mr. Harrison and the victim who says that it was certainly not, uh, the, the punishment didn't fit the crime. The article stated, and, and I know that you know this is well, that because a 20 year time period had passed between the offenses and the actual declaration of what had happened that the statutes of limitations had um, expired and there was no physical evidence to prove what she was alleging at the time. Do you think that there needs to be another look taken at that kind of um, legislation when it comes to people who have been victimized in such a way, especially at a young age when they're too traumatized to even, like you said, even realize that there has been an offense um, against their bodies and who may not even want to or can at the time of a several years speak out about it? Well, according to the information from the Attorney General's offices in, in St. Lucia, um, there is no statute of limitations on uh, child molestation. So it could have happened to you 50 years ago and you could find justice for it if you go now. Now, that is something that, you know, that might need to be changed. That There might need to be some new things in place uh, to say, you know, the statute of limitations is 15 years or 25 years uh, varying on the degree of what the um, child sex offense is. Again, we're in no way ever suggesting to the St. Lucian justice system what to do, but um, these are third-party recommendations that uh, we're passing along. So the... Um, the There's another thing in St. Lucia... I want to say it's called criminal rehabilitation, where after a certain period of time, your public record gets expunged and it allows you time to get your life back in order. I mean, these are things that will be looked into if a legal body in St. Lucia decides to convene and, and say that, hey, let's do something about these kind of laws. Because I don't know that, you know, if somebody molested you 50 years ago, if it's... um you know, I, I don't, I'm not saying that, that that shouldn't be brought out, but I don't know how we would deal with these things. And I do think there are loopholes in the system that um, need, you know, just, and, and it's not by the fault of anybody. It's not by the fault of any political party or any, um, you know, contribut contributor to the legal system. These are things that happen over time. As we grow as a society, we find loopholes in our systems. You know, as we grow as a people, we find loopholes in the, in the way we discipline ourselves. And we, you know, the part of growth and the part of evolution and um, becoming an enlightened people is is to make changes when you find something that no longer supports what you're what's currently happening fix it address it and fix it and so we did hear from the attorney general's office that there are these these particular loopholes that can be um addressed and we're working with people to help us see how we could make this a holistic thing for our community we do expect that you know there will be some resistance because whenever you're doing something new that has not been done, there's a lot of fear, and we expect that. And again, um, like I said the first time we spoke, that this is not going to be something that is easy or it's done overnight. And we, we are in this for the long haul. This may take a few years, but we have committed ourselves to seeing this through all the way. <clears throat> um, let's see. I would like to uh, draw some light to the fact that we um, are experiencing some resistance. Um, I'm not really concerned about it. We did get a a, re um, a reporter was going to share our petition, which would have you know greatly advanced our efforts in terms of adding more signatures to our cause. And he received a lawyer's letter from a lawyer in New Jersey representing. <clears throat> Felix Harrison, who was the man who, who kind of um, the attacks on us because I shared 
um, the article with his name um, kind of created an outcry in the St. Lucian people asking for this registry. He, this lawyer saying that she was representing him, this is what the reporter says to me. They received a correspondence from <clears throat> this lawyer's office saying that, you know, child abuse is not an issue in St. Lucia and our petition is not valid. So we contacted that lawyer's office to ask simply, did your office send this correspondence to the Jersey Journal? And the secretary spoke to us. She said she thinks they did, but she wasn't really sure. And she was kind of comical. She almost laughed me off the phone. And we've received no response from the lawyer confirming or denying that they sent that response. But why would a, a, a lawyer represent anybody? In, in this case, she's representing the offender, but uh, she has... the have any links with St. Lucia? How much research has she done? Does she have statistics about St. Lucia's sex offense that she would make that kind of statement, that kind of I mean, absolute statement without anything to back it up? You know, yes, and if Matthew Spicer, the reporter, if he was an independent journalist, he can he could make a decision and say, you know what, I'm just going to ignore this lady and I'll publish my article anyway. But he's not. He works for a business, a corporation that has a process. And, you know, not even his boss can say, oh, just ignore that letter. If you get a correspondence from a lawyer, it has to follow protocol and go to your legal team and they will address it in a timely manner. So he, the reporter, thought it was hilarious and absolutely ridiculous um, and a little offended that he couldn't get his article published because he had been working on it for a few weeks. So he just did what he had to do, sent it to his editors. The editor sent it to the legal team and it's in review so that's where we are with that. And we, we do expect resistance. We're not disheartened when, when it comes, but we're more encouraged that more organizations at the local level, at the regional level, at the um, international level, and even at the UN level have come out to support us and to stand with us. So... You know, anybody listening who is involved with this and who does want to pick this up, we are always accepting volunteers, and our volunteers start off at, I think, 17 years old in the U.S., and, and I'd have to confirm with um, our Xander Lee president of St. Lucia what the volunteer age is in St. Lucia. I want to say 16, um, 16 in the, in St. Lucia, in the region, um, and because we, we do have... Um, memberships in um we have members and volunteers in seven countries we have in st lucia obviously in the u.s where our headquarters is in canada brazil in germany in the uk and in barbados and we are establishing a zandoli club at ue cave hill um and hopefully this club will be the pilot to other clubs that we can launch at other schools, even at the high school level, at the secondary school level, um, in the region and internationally. And you know, I was just wondering, when I spoke to you about the statutes of limitations, I was speaking about the New Jersey statutes of limitations. Is there, is there um, any way that that could be, or do you think it should be revised for, for victims who cannot because of trauma? speak out about their experience? You know, I think New Jersey has been pretty thorough in implementing um, a system in place to deal with these issues. Again, even in a country and in a state, because each state has, you know, a different body of laws governing, it, governing its jurisdiction. Um, I think they've done a really good job to do what they can. And that's all we're, we're asking for St. Lucia. Do the best with what you have to do what you can to support the people. I think that, well, in this case, and again, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just somebody looking at the situation. So she, the, the, there's no way to prove anything that happened to her 20 years ago. So why plead guilty? You know, 
your lawyer would recommend to you to plead guilty if he saw or she saw that this wasn't going to go in your favor. So, yes, it's a slap on the wrist to her. I do believe so because people can argue and say, okay, we have no proof. This didn't happen. Yet he pleaded guilty. Why? Why did you plead guilty to something as heinous as being a child sex offender, knowing with that plea comes a certain amount of years as a registered sex offender? And, you know, something like that. You need supervision to see your own child who's underage. So we, I take those things into consideration. I'm no by no means... Um, a lawyer or an expert in the law, but just looking at it from a common sense perspective, if yeah, there there wasn't that much evidence. Um, why didn't you deny it? Why why did you come forth and say yes, I did this? I plead guilty to fourth um, degree sexual assault on a minor between the ages of eight and eleven. So that's my take on that. I don't really have much else to say about it or the legal system because again. Um, we're not here to ask any uh, government or institution to, um, and we can't, we cannot as a, as a nonprofit organization go to any government locally or in any foreign jurisdiction and say, change your laws. We want you to put this law in place. That is not our place. All we can do is make third part, make, make recommendations to third party organizations. And if those organizations see fit and they have the authority to do so, they can take it to the, um, bodies governing those legal, uh, um, those legislative committees in their area. Well, I suppose, we can see with um, the months and even maybe years that, that come on if uh, uh, Mr. Harrison would be willing to shed light uh, as far as the side of this goes. Uh, it has happened in the past and it may happen this time that uh, it's maybe some sort of uh, understanding from his end um, why this happened, why he engaged in those um, activities and again, like you said, why he decided to plead guilty to... Um, inappropriately sexually contacting a minor. Um, where, where are you at with signatures right now for the petition? Last time we spoke, you said you were at 700. What's it looking at now? Well, last time we spoke, we were at 640, and we, ex we really expected to be much further. We expected to be at least 1,000 by now, so we are midway through like the 700. I want to say so close to 750. I haven't checked it yet for the morning, but we're not discouraged. The petition alone is for one year long, so we have time, and we are, we are not discouraged at all. Yes, we experienced a setback, but from that setback came so much more support at at such a, a higher level than we expected. Um, so we really we're we're so happy actually um, for what's happening. The signatures will come. We do have a lot of things that we're putting in place, and um, you know we're working with churches and other NGOs in Saint Lucia and the Caribbean. We're not going to go away. Um, this is not going to get quiet. We're not going to stop talking about it. And we've just we've just begun. So to people resisting us, good luck. And that's, that's all I'm going to say. But the people out there who are supporting us, the children out there that feel encouraged, who are being molested and are feeling encouraged by what we're doing, do not give up. Um... It was a little bit of a setback in terms of spreading the message, but it actually spiraled us into a different direction where things are actually moving faster for us, and we have more support at um, at the decision making levels than um, one would have imagined. It just it's so awesome because every time we're being blocked by particular people and groups that are, are trying to dissuade and distract the public from our, our focus, and our focus is child molestation prevention. I'm not going to say that enough. Child molestation prevention at this time is our only issue, and we are a transparent organization. All our information is available online. If 
people need access to our past records. Those things are easily pulled up. Um, so we are excited. We're excited by all the names. And really, Natalie, it's on the tip of my tongue. Like everyone that's come out to support this and make this something really special. But I'll respect our protocol and, you know, rules. And I'll speak on it when the time is necessary. Um, in the meantime, we're just gathering momentum. So I will say to persons, if you're an individual in St. Lucia, you're at least 16 years of age, you'd like to volunteer, check out our website. You can click on Make a Difference, and from there you can choose how you want to make a difference. Do you want to volunteer? Do you want your church to, to take on this cause for us or your cultural club? Um, there's so many ways that people can contribute, and we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of supporters. So feel encouraged anybody out there who's listening and who wants to see this happen we are going to make this happen we're not going to go away and we're not going to give up on it and you know Camille I, I wanted to uh, just reiterate again like you said last time when we spoke on the air that you can sign the petition anonymously if you so desire well you can sign it without showing your name online and what we're going to do is our ground team, our St. Lucian branch, is uh, they're going to start collecting signatures by hand on the ground um, in the coming weeks so that we, you know, not everybody has access to a computer. And some people are a little um, hesitant to put their name and their address online to sign a petition and, and they don't know who has access to this information although it's completely safe you know um the platform we're using has done 83 million over 83 million petitions and um it's a very trustworthy petition you know people petition the the president of the united states all the time people have petitioned officials um heads of states in People have petitioned the queen. You know, nobody is above a petition and anybody can start a petition. So we're just doing what we can to spread the message. And the petition shouldn't be seen as, you know, you signing this means you're disrespecting your government or you're insulting them. No, not at all. This is not an aggressive petition. We have a petition simply to say, all right, enough people are concerned about this that maybe... It's something that you should be concerned about, too. And, you know, you as our government, and I speak as a citizen of St. Lucia, you as our government should address these issues. That's how petitions work. It's not we're being disrespectful or we're bullying the government. By no means. Again, change.org, 83 million plus petitions from this place to governments in almost every single country in the world. And other governments don't take it as a threat. It's just a normal thing, you know. Um, and what's what's funny that the, the lawyer said to the reporter said that, oh, we only created this petition out of frustration of, you know, Mr. Felix Harrison pleading guilty. Well, you know, that's how petitions are started. They're started out of frustration because nothing is being done. Um, you know, CAFRA submitted a request for a sex offender registry already and, and nothing happened. They they weren't successful with it. So um, we are, I'm not blaming the government or saying that they didn't address this, but I think, you know, at times... There are a lot of things on the plate, and it's a matter of, of priority, of, of what to take care of. And sometimes you have to make that call as an elected official and choose, well, we deal with this issue now, or do we deal with this issue now? And sometimes, you know, th there are things that, and as bad as this sounds, they make that call sometimes to deal with things that seem more pressing at the time. Um, and that's neither here nor there. A petition is simply saying to our officials, all right, it has become a priority because enough people are talking about it. And this is something you as a government will have support on because here are thousands of people supporting this. And it's time to address this issue. 
We are no by no means trying to bully anyone. So, yes, you can sign the petition online without showing your name, without fear that, you know, where you work or, or whoever you work for, you're going to lose your contracts or lose your job for it. Um, yeah, and when we're in St. Lucia, we will be collecting signatures by hand. So we'll have more on, on those things to come. Yes, indeed. And uh, Camille will also be hopefully... Uh, if she so desires and she still um, uh, in approval of this, will be speaking to the victim herself uh, along with you on March 14, which is the day after the official sentencing of Mr. Harrison. Yes, she did say, um, at first she said no, because she actually was, ho when all of this came out, she was hospitalized for um, anxiety attacks where she could not breathe. And to think that this happened to her so long ago, but a story like this breaking got her to the point where she was having a nervous breakdown and was hospitalized for it. We have to take these things into consideration and be sensitive, especially in how we discuss these things on social media, because people are suffering and, you know, all the noise about it, all the noise of saying that she lied and this didn't happen to her and the way that people who were defending her, such as myself and other other um, voices came out to stand up for this young lady. Oh, I hear a little baby Natalie in the background. Um, so I'm going to have to cut this short and uh, maybe we can convene at another time. Yes, March 14th, the victim is um, prepared to speak on um, and shed some light on things that are happening. I'm going to go run and, and collect my little boy. Absolutely, Camille. Perfectly understood. Thank you very quickly. Thank you to you. And we'll speak again very soon, okay? Thank you so much, Natalie. Have a good morning. You too, love.